I'm looking to have a vasectomy done. Oh, okay. With sterilization, is there pain? Oh. Severe testicular pain. I'm not doing it anymore. You don't want to get the snip snip. Okay, so if you cut that thing and you're going to go back now and do the deed, yeah. what comes out? Noni! Have, have you ever had a condom break or burst or tear? I've experienced a condom breaking. I was using choice at the time. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Suhail Essa. This is Dr. Nklanta Vilagasi. Dr. Dr. Brendan Matthews. This is Dr. Nassim Sharif. And this is the Gentleman's Technical Technic Technic Podcast. Podcast. Good evening and welcome to another episode of the Gentleman's Clinic Podcast. Six South African male medical doctors on a mission to change the way in which we perceive men's health care. My name is Dr. Suhail Essa, and I'm joined in the studio with Dr. Vishay Naidu, Dr. Brendan Matthews, Dr. Nassim Sharif, and Dr. Ntlantla Vilagaz. And on today's episode, we are, as you can all see, not joined by anyone, so it's back to just the five of us that you know and love. So we're going to be starting off the way we always start off, uh, and that's with interesting cases of the week. So, gentlemen... What interesting cases have you guys encountered this week? Vishen, I know you have something. <laughs> I know you got something Can juicy. Can I just mention something? Yeah. I got told this past week that uh, Gentleman's Clinic is gaslighting the country. Gaslighting the country? Yeah. What does gaslighting that mean? Gaslighting the country. Hmm. So I don't understand this new word, gaslighting. I think it's a Gen so, so, Z yeah, or yeah, it's I'm a 2000 mm. uh, word. But apparently it's because we always say six medical doctors on the podcast, but we are five. Yes, because the, the, the sixth one is a, is a ghost. He, he doesn't appear in front of the right. camera. So is he a financer? Uh, he's a, we don't he's advisor. Advisor. Yeah, he's, he's a blesser. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he watches from afar and appreciates. Yeah, but there are six of us. There's, there's six, six of us. us. There's six of us. And we all add value to, to the podcast in our own unique way. And mm. uh, speaking of unique things that we encounter, uh, Vish, <laughs> Tell us about what you had this week. We know you got something juicy for us. Always. So, so you work at, at Joburg Generate as mm. well. Um, I'm sure you know we get a lot of referrals from other uh, yep. hospitals. So essentially, there was this gentleman, a young guy. <clears throat> he, uh, he was referred as a patient who, not sure who, but pretty much had a, a c- ring. A uh, penile ring, in, uh, basically, that was stuck on his penis. Yeah. So, the issue with this now was it's been on there for quite a long time, and it had now eroded through quite a lot of the tissue, the mm-hmm. penile tissue. So, the urethra, which is the the urine pipe, actually had um, been transected. It was completely cut. cut. Sure. Yeah. And um, the rest of the penis was now almost. Growing around, uh, yeah, the, pretty much. <laughs> so, yeah. wait, how long was this um, thing in place? <sighs> to be fair, I, th- I think the guy just the patient actually just gives a really poor history, mm. so he also himself doesn't know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I mean, at the end of the day, you just have to treat the patient. But and, you were saying uh, earlier that when we were discussing the interesting cases before we jumped on you, that it wasn't just his penis, so. St- a strange thing, actually, I noticed, um, obviously, when seeing the patient, he had these rings on his fingers as well. Mm. So, almost on every finger, mm-hmm. it was almost as if they were a few sizes too small, and they had now eroded through his fingers as well. What? A lot of, some of the rings, you could see that there's been long-standing effects, where his fingers were pretty much almost down to the bone. What? Yeah, it was, sure. it was really... So, really so he has see. some sort of like a weird fetish where he likes rings. Uh, or a mental health it's condition. a mental health care yeah. condition. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've never heard of that. What, <clears throat> what problem does that fall under? Because clearly it's like some obsession. The man has an obsession with rings. Yeah. Specifically no, so wearing rings too, too small on mm. appendages that don't yeah. need can, them. Can generalize like swelling of so the body. From, so I mean it could, be, um, it could be like psychotic disorder of some mm. sort. Yeah. You know, I think it's more like he puts the ring on and is not um, so the the effect of pain that pro- that a normal person would probably experience. True, he mm. doesn't experience uh, 
that sure. pain or that thought that I need to take this off, you know? 100%. Because mm. it I, you said it basically squeezed through the penis, through the skin, yeah. even mm. transected through the, the urethra. So yeah. pee was coming through, like, not through the pee hole, <clears throat> through the shaft. Yeah. So oh. the urine was coming through the shaft. <clears throat> Shame, yeah. man. Yeah, no, that's... Uh, well, did you manage to fix him up? How do you fix that? So there's a few problems that were wrong. Um, so I think also, I mean, you kind of have to also get to the bottom of why mm. this was happening. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, treating patient holistically, you know, with mm. mental health care, illness, you know, psychology, things like that. But essentially for that problem, um, the ring had to be removed, first of all. Um, and then we had to get continuity of the urethra. Uh, fortunately, the wound was actually quite clean. Um, so we actually went under a reconstruction procedure for the urethra. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's still actually, yeah, I mean, still recovering from that. So we'll see how that, that goes. Mm. You said you guys don't do penile implants, eh? I mean, as urologists, we do. But uh, currently where I work, we, we don't actually have, uh, so essentially the reps need to provide the penile implants. Oh, so we don't, have the we don't actually have uh, the resources for that. Uh, I know in some other state sectors or state hospitals, they do actually uh, perform them. Mm-hmm. It, it just depends on whether you can get the reps to um, bring the implants to your hospital. Can I just, can I just ask something away from the c- rings now on, on you, on the, um, Urologist, is it true or is it just my experience that urologists are not offering vasectomies that much anymore? In state, it's not in state, state, but in private. Because personally, I've actually inquired with two urologists, mm. private urologists, and they said oh. they don't do it. Um, no, so I only so have two. But is it something? So it's, it's not helping? something that that that's not within the scope of practice. It is. I think it's just um, there's a lot of litigation behind doing a vasectomy. Yeah. Uh, it's now becoming more and more, well, the litigation uh, practice. Why, why is it becoming more prevalent yeah, I mean, that you get getting litigation? I'm looking to have a vasectomy done. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. I think I've, uh, <clears throat> you, you, you're done. Uh, yeah, no, no. You've no, 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 had enough. Vasectomy. Huh? What is a vasectomy? So, male sterilization. Male sterilization. Vish, you want to tell us quickly about the procedure, just <clears throat> briefly, so that is <clears throat> Okay, so... For for people, I think laymans that that don't really well, wouldn't know the, the exact terminology for some of the anatomy, you have a cord on each testicle which um, carries your sperm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so mm-hmm. that cord. Uh, What's that cord called? Vish? So that cord, which is called the vas deferens, mm-hmm. essentially needs to be ligated or or, or, or cut and tied mm-hmm. off. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The same uh, like a guy who would cut a woman's tubes that carry the egg. Yes. Well, the, like. they don't really cut it. They yeah, just yeah, tie yeah, it. I mean, but yeah. In simple terms. So, so cut it. they do cut it. They you do cut and tie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. There are different techniques. So, I mean, with, with the guy one. one. Yeah. Um, the same with us. is also different yeah. techniques. But yeah. yeah. So essentially, in depends how the urologist may do it. Uh, you can either have one or two incisions on either mm. side of the scrotum. Uh, you need to but you have to do both testes, obviously. Yeah. So you can't just do one. And, you can't uh, just do one. <laughs> so what is the litigation about? I mean, if I decide I want to be sterilized, I don't want children anymore, why would I go and sue a urologist now? So, for example, say you now go there and you say, you know, you want this procedure, they do it for you. And then a year or two years later, you, for example, you might find, if you happen to find another partner mm. and you want to have children again now, or, okay. yeah, okay. for example, uh, it comes actually, it's quite often where someone may have an, our new partner and they want to yeah. have kids with that partner. Okay. Mm. They obviously know what procedure they've done. They come back or they go to another urologist and say, look, I've had this procedure. Um, I'm now with someone else. I want to have this procedure reversed. So technically, um, however, obviously it, it may be challenging to do the procedure. It's still... Uh, we're still able to technically do the procedure to reverse it mm. and uh, mm. rejoin the tube. But the problem with that is <clears throat> there's a risk, obviously, of uh, stricturing or narrowing of that tube. Mm-hmm. But secondly, if it's been after quite a while, what mm. happens actually to the testicle is the production of semen of sperm actually isn't um, 
normal. It's not the same as it was before. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So because essentially once you tie that tube, there's a lot of back pressure mm. in the testicle, mm-hmm. which can cause damage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So although you might technically be able to realign the anatomy and the tube is now patent, the actual production of the sperm isn't. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 Th- that's I- it's interesting <coughs> that you mention that because. Uh, from from uh, discussions and uh, stuff that I've had with other people who have undergone the procedure, they they seem to believe or have been told, and you can correct me, but they 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 seem to have this idea that it's a fully reversible procedure, mm-hmm. and hey, the moment you want to get have kids again, we'll tie you back up and you'll get to go, but it doesn't seem like that's the reality. Yeah. It's not. So so again, saying so what would you say like rates rates of regaining your fertility post vasectomy so again um surgically the procedure is uh, you can do the procedure obviously yeah. it, mm. it takes long it's technically challenging and there are complications uh surgically they can be but depends so for example say you do the procedure now and a month later you want it reversed at that point the actual testicle the factory that's producing the sperm isn't damaged mm-hmm. so your rates obviously much uh, yeah. higher of of being able to uh, achieve fertility <coughs> whereas for example someone who's now two years down the line the rates are very low yeah yeah mm. so, and, so and just one question yes, um this vast difference does it have blood supply to yeah. you so yeah. you also cut off the blood supply no no, no. so the same like the fallopian tube if you're tying that it's just that tu- you're just ligating that the the tube that's mm. carrying the sperm because you know essentially if you like if you tie that off and and cut it there's no way for the, the, that sperm is not going to be able to go yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah, I, see. I think an important yeah. one is that um obviously we encourage uh, uh, men to also equally get um you know contraception but um with sterilization is there pain you spoke about back pressure yeah Do men so, experience pain so that's another side effect so some patients may have uh new or severe testicular pain uh, post the uh, procedure yeah, i'm Ooh. not doing it anymore no no, no. <laughs> so, so it's not with everybody but you don't want to get the snip snip <laughs> so it can yeah. be chronic ochalgia which is chronic testicular pain another question which i'm sure probably some of the viewers are, are thinking to in, themselves in really severe cases they may have to remove the testicle Whoa, oh no, wow no no no, no. As, yeah, as, no as, as, as a last yeah, yeah. as a last resort Mm, it's fine. There are other methods of contraception, but the question that I wanted to ask was, um, and I'm sure a lot of viewers are probably wondering, like, okay, so if you cut that thing, and you're gonna go back now and do the deed, yeah, what comes out? Yeah, what uh, comes out during ejaculate? So I think ultimately it is. A, I think it's a it's a good option for um, sterilization if you've now committed to that decision or lifestyle choice yeah mm-hmm. um but yeah pretty much as you're saying what comes out it's uh just the seminal fluid, seminal fluid yeah. no sperm inside so just yeah. prostate fluid is it gonna be yeah. clear that clear fluid yeah not thick i think s- well there's no sperm in it there's, there's no yeah. sperm yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah okay so I, I, I mean, at least because I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, like, so then when when you reach that climax, it just hit and done. Yeah. And there's nothing. So that uh, yeah. that but be anti-climax. Something to also <laughs> be like careful about is obviously after the procedure, it's not straight away that you. So you can't now go and like ejaculate in someone and and think they won't get pregnant because yeah, yeah. there's still sperm in the oh, in the, the actual... tubes that were already there. Oh. Mm. So yeah. what's the waiting um, period? So, most of the times, well, they say around six months. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately, what you can do is uh, do a semen analysis to confirm, rather than waiting uh, a period. Yeah. So you do a semen analysis. It'll might say obviously, obviously the sperm count and etc. on that, and then you pretty much will do it until there's no sperm in mm. the in the ejaculate. So every, mm-hmm. oh, to be, that's that's the to be safe, safe yeah. to be yeah. safe yeah. Yeah. yeah every week or month you go to lancet and pluck and then they tell you no there's no sperms your key because essentially all you yeah. need is one literally <laughs> one sperm <laughs> yeah that Brendan. that's yeah. that's what yeah. people do yeah. okay uh, but uh, uh, just one last question for yeah. um what at what age would you say is there even an age to do this procedure um where you can say 
according to your guys guidelines if a patient is less than 35 for example <coughs> they can't do it or it's just i mean it's about no. what the person so it's, it's again what the patient prefers so i've seen patients who are under 30 actually that mm. uh, requested the procedure sure, sure. yeah okay yeah. Interesting. Well, uh, let's move swiftly on uh, to Brendan. Uh, we wanted to discuss your MED, mm. your master's study topic, seeing yeah. as uh, the, the second part generally of our podcast is us discussing interesting case studies. And yeah. we thought, why not discuss one of our own doctor's uh, yeah. studies that, that he's actually conducting? So tell us a little bit about your master's and, and the research that you, you've been doing personally. Yeah, so over the past um, three years, I've been doing you know, um, research at um, at a university in South Africa. I can't say the name. Okay. Um, but we've been doing in a, uh, research at a university. And um, basically, I've been looking at the concept of stealthing. You guys know what stealthing is? No. I've heard of it, but tell us. Do you know what stealthing? Yeah. <coughs> um, so stealthing would be... Um, having protected sex or sex with a condom and removing a condom without your your partner sort of consent yeah. or being aware. Mm. Yes, yes. Yeah. So stealthing looks at a different um, a different type of condom misuse. So you get improper condom usage where either condom breaks or you say you're going to use it with your partner and you don't use it or it falls off or you mm. put Vaseline on and it breaks or, mm. you know, improper use. Okay. okay. But stealthing specifically is the, the, the intent, the intent or purposeful removal of a condom mm. by a penetrative partner um, without the consent of the receptive partner. Mm. Ah, I see. So I'm saying penetrative and receptive because mm. it's men and women mm. okay course, that yeah. we that we looked at um so why it's so interesting is because in south africa we don't have data on this um and it's important because it has potential outcomes yep. uh, pa Definitely. bad outcomes mm -hmm. um the specific outcomes that i looked at were unwanted pregnancies stis including hiv mm. um as well as psychological and legal outcomes um, because you could make a very strong argument that it's rape. Of you course. Know? Um, so, so that's still being discussed, you know. Um, What's your study methodology? How are you going to go about so I was, this so data? I, so I've obtained it already. I've got the raw data. Um, so I'll share a bit about that. I can't explain too much until I have actually sifted the data course, and have yeah. um, um, all the, the pure data mm -hmm. and publish. So I'm looking to publish by June this year. Um, and then we can look at it again once I've published it. But um, basically what I've found is that it is happening. It is happening. Quite prevalent inside of Yeah. Africa. So I've done a cross-sectional study, questionnaire-based, um, where, ba where I basically asked participants if this has ever happened to you and whether you've ever done it. You know, mm -hmm. you understand. Mm -hmm. So has someone ever done it to you okay. or have you ever done it as a partner? Mm -hmm. And then all the potential outcomes, and we look at other um, potential variables as well. Um, so, so what I can say right now is that what I see from the raw data is that yes, this is happening in South Africa at least within that sample group, mm -hmm. and yes, there are outcomes. So I think this is great because once I've published, it might it might uh, influence a lot of a lot of research going forward. You know, mm. our legal our legal um, framework doesn't really speak to this type of behavior, um, stalking specifically. And also, I think it's an important topic about men and condom use. Yes. It's, mm. it's a big, for some reason, men don't want to use condoms. Mm. And then also, you, you hear the story that condom broke, right? So a man will be using a condom, he'll stealth, and he'll say, oh, it just broke. That's why I took it off. Yes, right? yes. Mm -hmm. But you need to see those videos of how Durex ads I've seen a condom stretch like massively. You can fill a balloon, right? Mm, mm. Those condoms are resilient. You, they don't break, right? For no reason. Yeah. Yeah. If it tears, the vagina wall will tear first before the condom tears. <laughs> what? 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 No. Honestly, that's how insane. There's no way you're breaking condom. What? So yeah. you can you can have a you can put a condom on a cu you can put a condom on a cucumber, <laughs> cut the cucumber through the condom. <laughs> what? So, so how do people always, like say this thing about condom tearing? They they, they stealthed. They took it off so, because they don't they don't yeah. feel. That's the thing. That's the reason why. 
Okay, yeah. look. I think let's, what let's, is let's important, talk guys. Let's put the question to the table. <laughs> yeah, have, yeah. Has, has, has that ever happened to you? Have, have you ever had a condom break or burst or tear? Because, I mean, yeah. NAS is suggesting that if you take a knife, you can yeah. cut a cucumber through through the condom. <laughs> and <laughs> and the goes, condom doesn't break. And, and the condom doesn't tip. break. Yes. Have you ever experienced I've experienced the condom breaking before. I, I don't and, understand uh, it. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. Never, I, I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe we're not using the Same, condom yeah. break. Yeah, maybe maybe yeah. it's only to your extent. Yeah. Um, Lanza was using choice at the time. Banana flavor. Explain that. I was protecting myself. I got let down by a condom. Grape flavor. Grape. Yeah. So, so yes, not entirely. And I think we do see a lot of patients with that problem. It's very difficult to tell whether, I mean, someone is stealthing and someone. You know, um, but as as Brenda said, it's the intent. It's the intent. Yes, and yes, then, yes, I'm sure yes, with your study, yes. we'll be able to oh, figure yeah, out. Like, like there there are reasons that they've that have been given why they stealth, right? So <clears throat> I I hypothesize that they stealth or remove the condom without consent because they scared the girl will say no, or the yeah. receptive partner will say no. But the reason behind why? So just looking fast at the raw data. Is there's a few reasons is that, um, condom is dry. Vagina is dry. They can't climax with the condom on. Mm. So they feel like, ah, I'm not gonna, you know, climax with this condom on. Mm. Uh, the only way I'm gonna climax is if I take the condom off. This is their thinking. And then they do it without getting consent from, yeah. from the, from their partner. Just yeah. ethically, like, how are you able to collect the, the data? So, so I don't know if we've, chatted this but yeah so yeah the 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 human resource or uh, ethics committee at the specific university where I conducted the the research it's quite a robust process mm. they actually said to me that your research is uh, can put, can cause potential harm mm. um so i had to actually provide um how can it services. cause potential harm so there's quite a few ways in that um people who might have experienced yeah. it might relive it because ah, um, okay. it might have affected them. They might have a baby through this or had uh, got HIV through it. And now they relive that trauma. Um, Just by your questioning. <clears throat> yes. Mm -hmm. And okay. and perhaps people who have done it might, um, f you know, start feeling that they've committed a crime, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. that type of thing. So I had to actually provide services such as like um, counseling service, crisis services, you know, suicide services law services and also legal services that are available um after the study which so just looking access. at um at uh the person obviously who, who did it and the person who it got done to yes okay. yes that's looking at both because you want to understand okay. why someone does it and also why um what are potential outcomes of those that it's have been done to ah Okay, no, no, that's yeah. very interesting. So and I mean, the to one one of the potential outcomes, uh, as as you you mentioned, is uh, it, it, transmission of STDs. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so, Inlantla actually just, had done some. Or do you wanna add? Yeah. <clears throat> so, just want to know, obviously, in terms of um, just raw stats. I mean, uh, um, obviously, you probably don't have them as yet. But was it more common in heterosexual uh, mm -hmm. partners or homosexual partners? So, my my sample size of of homos was not high, was not for large enough, um, but it occurred in both heterosexual and homosexual um, relationships. However, the the frequency I don't know yet because if mm. I had five homosexual couples where it happened versus fifty heterosexuals, I'll have to calculate a frequency mm. because it could have been. 10 out of 50 heterosexuals and 4 out of 5 mm. homosexuals and then it would be more homosexuals yeah, yeah. You know? yeah, so yeah, yeah. it happens in both um, if you look at if you look at data in homosexual relationships if you look at media it, it you would get the idea that it happens a lot there there's some wild crazy things that I've seen that happen among homosexual communities that 
I don't even want to get into right now. Mm-hmm. But, we uh, can get into yeah. that. Yeah, we can, but I think uh, let's move uh, yeah, to yeah, the yeah, potential yeah, yeah, outcomes yeah. of uh, of of stealthing, which is STDs. <coughs> and Lantla, you you had come across quite a mm. interesting study on the prevalence yeah, yeah. of of cur- curable STDs. Sure, I thought it was very important for us to talk about this, uh, considering that. Um, so one of the were, things we we treat at the Gens Club exactly, yeah, but yeah, but there actually was a media release or media briefing um, by the Department of Health to say that we actually have an STI pandemic mm-hmm. in the country. Wow, like early like a month ago. Yeah, I'm like not mistaken. January, yeah. February. Jan. So I thought maybe <clears throat> you know let's touch on this and and yeah. Of course. I chose one study. There's a lot to read on STIs and 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 everything. The reason why I chose this one is because it's a new study. Okay. It's a it's it's a well powered study. It, it was a randomized controlled trial. Uh, it was done in KZN in a very rural setting where we know HIV prevalence is very very, very, very high. high. KZN, yeah, yes. yeah, highest I think almost in the world. Yes, in KZN specifically. Yeah. So this study was um, conducted by you know a couple of doctors, which I think is important to mention, Doctor uh, Jerlomova and uh, Chidua uh, okay. at Al. Quite a lot of doctors, which is great. So they looked at any STIs, but primarily focused on three, right? So they looked at um, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and um, trachomon- trachomoniasis, right? Mm-hmm. So what they basically did is they took um, they took about two thousand patients who were eligible for the study in that population, and um, and I think there was something like a thousand seven. I just want to get the actual number. Uh, 1,743 patients who are actually eligible to participate in the study. And what they found in the result is that although the other or any other STIs were the most prevalent, the ones that they weren't really looking at. Um, so what they did is they had to co- obviously collect uh, blood and do the necessary tests of in course, all these yeah. patients. Yeah, They found that gonorrhea was actually 5% uh, of the patients that qualified. Mm. Chlamydia was almost 18%, 17.9% was chlamydia. Wow. Which we actually have been seeing, by the way, some of the patients that I've seen yeah. mm-hmm. uh, who've tested positive, even in Johannesburg, for chlamydia mainly. Which I obviously with, before the study I didn't understand why people were, you know, singling out chlamydia. I just thought, you know, it's one of them. Yeah, mm. but I, I guess also the type of medicine I practice, I'm in the eye, um, and then trachomaniasis was six percent. Um, the other STIs accounted for twenty three point twenty three point seven percent. 23.7% and um, yeah. So basically the World Health Organization has been advocate. So in South Africa, how we currently treat STIs is we use a syndromic management plan. Basically yeah. you kind of get the same drugs for whatever you have. Yeah, so right? depending on just just to, yeah. uh, for, for, for them to understand, mm. based on a, a set of symptoms and yes. an algorithm that we use. Exactly. If you've got a discharge with, you know, uh, ulcer versus Depending on what what your symptoms that you present with, we will tra- treat a, a a broad group of those symptoms with a set uh, set uh, so the broad antibiotic spectrum therapy. Antibiotics, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, so basically, what the study then revealed is what the World Health Organization has been advocating for. That um, yes, we understand that in in our country, in a third world country, where finances and all that is, I mean, that's why we even have these syndromic type of management. Um, that we, we need to actually start thinking about shifting towards more community specific etiology finding, like trying to actually find what certain communities or certain areas like this KZN district or rural area, what's prevalent there. Mm. So that when patients go to the local clinic, they actually get treated for, for specifically what they have and, and they yeah. get the best results because, um, sometimes you might be covered. For example, if you get, you treat them wrong, um, I, I think what they're trying to say is that certain infections or certain STIs can be prevalent in certain areas uh, and we shouldn't be sind- sort of grouping everyone into this one sort of plan. And uh, the best results were actually are actually retrieved from from making sure mm-hmm. that you specify your treatment and target certain communities instead of a, a syndrome. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's kind of what we're trying to achieve with the Gens Clinic. You know, mm-hmm. we, we're, we're targeting a specific niche, men, right? Mm-hmm. Men who have this issue and have the access to internet and can come uh, co- conveniently and discreetly consult with us. Yeah. We've got a list of images that 
match kind of your yeah. symptoms. Mm-hmm. You'll select it on the survey. Uh, and based on that, it aids us in plugging that into the algorithm to get a diagnosis. Exactly. And so that we can give you the syndromic broad spectrum antimicrobial mm-hmm. therapy that you require specifically for your problem. Exactly. So I think, uh, yeah, very interesting. And we'll, a, yeah. Mm, another thing that uh, just to add on what we obviously provide mm-hmm. is that even with seeing those pictures and, and, and seeing what the problem could be, I mean, since we are one of the, actually the findings of this study was that the current way or the current methods in which we address or treat STIs mm. is actually also not patient friendly. Like, I mean, yeah. imagine you have a shank or an ulcer on your penis and you have to walk to a clinic, see yeah. a random sister you don't know, whip out your penis, you know. Yeah. But, you know, whip with, it with, out. <laughs> <laughs> with the advantage of vi- yeah, virtual nobody's medicine. Nobody's whipping that thing out when you've got an STI. <laughs> yeah. you, are, you are revealing it at it best. Is, yeah. <laughs> but with, with the services that we're providing and the fact that obviously there's, there's a lot of privacy that we've invested in our platform 100 uh, you, you can actually share these pictures you know yeah. and it and it, i mean it removes platform. yes you don't have to actually you physically go and see or someone be ashamed or be ashamed yeah. Yeah. i mean it's, it's way more different sending a picture mm. than going and actually showing someone you know yeah. there's no face to the picture and nah. it's nice because the doctor treats the, the, the problem and not you exactly 100 you know? that it's futuristic that's mm. what we're trying to achieve but now as we approach about halfway through our episode one thing that we haven't done and i thought it'd be interesting to do uh in in the seventh episode that we have is let's take some questions that we've got from patients and yeah. see if we can give them proper advice based on the questions they ask yeah. so these are some of the questions you guys have sent through either on our instagram or youtube or on our social media that you wanted us specifically to answer so we decided on this episode we're going to give it a shot are you guys ready yeah let's yeah. go okay so the first question someone asked Straight up, why is my sperm thin and watery? Guys, any <laughs> any Dr. ideas? Uh, Nassim? So it could be because there's a low sperm count. Mm-hmm. That is one of the reasons. Okay. Yeah. Or you could have just been ejaculating a lot. Yeah. It's also, he didn't specify whether it was throughout his whole life or something's just recently mm-hmm. changed. So I think that's important to, to, yeah. to determine. Yeah. If it was his whole life, maybe he's just got a really low sperm count and that's why... As as visual, when we were talking about the vasectomy and stuff, there's a difference between the actual fluid and the the sticky stuff, yeah. the thick stuff, which is your actual <laughs> sperm. So you're just ejaculating seminal fluid. Yeah. yeah. So there's no sperms in that. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That happens yeah. if you, like you said, if you ejaculate too much. Mm. So like, by by how many rounds should you stop from a sperm point of view? So. When collecting a, a semen analysis, they generally say, so for example, if you go for a semen analysis, they say you should at least be um, absent for at least two days. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So two days load. So here's a question, and this one is made not from patients, but if if you with someone and you like these guys are say, ah, I can go four, five, six rounds. Is there a point where they can <laughs> the now tank know, is empty. the tank is empty and they can now ejaculate inside mm-hmm. and they won't and you won't fall pregnant? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no sperm yeah, left. No, there's no Theoretically, <laughs> there, but theoretically, no, but like so surely at a point, there's not no that more, I'm not. There's nothing left in the you tank. Need one you only sperm. need one you sperm. Need one sperm. Uh, that's what you yeah. should say. You only need one sperm. So, so that's not at all a method of contraception. Yes, not no. at all. Not, not at, at all. all. Disclaimer, please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but um, also the other thing, interestingly, is, and <clears throat> and uh, it's something to probably consider. A lot of patients, like when they talk in their lay terms, they'll say, "No, I'm leaking sperm." They'll say, <laughs> yes. "My maybe they'll yes. say my sperm is like thin and water and leaking sperm," and that's actually a sign of potential discharge, oh, actual STD. urethral discharge yeah. from an STD. Mm. So it could also just be that you have an and STD. We've heard that a lot. All of us have heard that, eh? Yeah. 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 Think yeah. yeah. Was, huh? <laughs> when I've, yeah, when we were in in med school, so the brass says, "I'm yeah. leaking spams. Spams are coming out." <laughs> 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 Meanwhile, it wasn't that. <laughs> it was trust. It, it was yeah. an STI. So, but the the other thing that you're also mentioning, Nasim, is uh, with regards to frequency, frequency. So. Increased frequency of ejaculation mm. potentially can cause you to have a more thin mm. and watery. Yep. Yeah. Anything else? Or shall we move on to the next we can question? Move on to the next one. Cool. Perfect. Um, 
the next question someone asked is, I had sex with someone that I don't trust. Can I get HIV from two, two, it's a two part question. So I, I had sex with someone that I don't trust. <clears throat> Can I get HIV from oral sex? And how long do I have to take the, that, that ARV medication? Uh, is there also something that I can use, a medication I can use to prevent from contracting HIV? Yeah. Uh, so let's first answer the first part of that question. So mm -hmm. they had sex with somebody that they don't trust. Now they, they're also scared, firstly, uh, about specifically oral penetration. Can okay. you get HIV from oral penetration? My answer is yes, potentially. Yeah. I, I don't... I don't really want to speak about the medical, um, what medically we know, uh -huh. because South Africa has such a high HIV rate and prevalence yeah. that I feel like if you talk about what we know in the medical world, people might use this in the wrong way. Yeah. However, so you start talking about, oh, in the saliva, there's not as much. Yes. And know. if you say like, if you have sex, there's actually like a less than 1% chance of having, of getting HIV from mm. vaginal penetration. If you have anal penetration, then it goes to like higher 1.5 to 2. I stand corrected of this, but um, it's there in that range, I know for sure. Um, so I don't want people to think, ah, let me go sonoro, because <laughs> <I, okay, laughs> it's only 1%. Oh no. my goodness. <laughs> I understand. These, mm. these prevalences, these rates change with your exposure. How long you are in there? Are there yes. cuts on your penis? Are there mm. cuts in the vagina? Of course. Are you circumcised? You know, are you circumcised? The viral load, the viral viral load of yeah. the patient, mm. you know, are they mm. on medication? Yeah. So we need to be aware of this. Um, but generally speaking, those are the percentage chances. Um, uh, however, another thing that's very important is that all our guidelines say, if you live in South Africa and you are exposed to HIV in South Africa, you are positive until proven otherwise. Mm, mm, That's mm. because we have the highest number in the world. Yeah. And that leads us to the, the question that they were asking about, you know, there's a medication. They've heard of a medication that yeah. you can take after you've had unprotected intercourse with yeah. someone that you don't yes. trust. Or I, I wouldn't even say just anyone. Let's first, anyone classify, then. Let's first ca classify those different kinds because there's PEP, P-E-P, -E and then there's PREP, yeah. P-R-E-P. So define that for us, yeah. So that's pre, first one is, let's say PrEP, right? Pre-exposure prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. So pre-exposure. Which they also asked about, yeah. Right, so pre-exposure prophylaxis is the medication you take before you have sex or before you have an encounter uh, to prevent HIV, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, guys, there's a lot of people on PrEP, actually. There's mm -hmm. a lot of mo people motivated to go and spread PrEP in the, in the, in the country, right? PrEP does not prevent a, um, STIs. PrEP does not prevent pregnancy. So if you are taking PrEP, you must know that you must still use a condom. This is an important point, right? Mm. So, okay, let's say on PrEP, you take a tablet every day, right? Yeah. And this prevents um, HIV. Lifelong, right? huh? Basically. Yeah. Once you stop, I think you can stop for like your last encounter, you can have it after a week, right? Mm. So from your last, your last encounter, one week afterwards, then you can stop, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So that's PrEP. How long before? Mm-hmm. Uh, two days or it used to, a week? It used to be seven days for for anal, and they divided anal, penis, vagina. But I think now, all across the board, just I think it's like three days, two, three days. days yeah. Huh? Then there's PEP, right? So PEP is post um, post exposure prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. So after you've had um, something that was not planned, an encounter, right? So now you want to prevent HIV, maybe some stealth thing, or you got a needle stick injury or something that happened. So you'd take um, an antiviral medication for a month afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. you must test again after six months. Yeah, and it's important also, um, I think they, they were asking the question about how long after. So the, mm -hmm. the I mean, ideally is as soon as, sooner rather than later, mm -hmm. but I think the maximum amount of time is five days post mm -hmm. uh, un unanticipated intercourse with, with someone that you so the you know, so the best familiar effect with. is three days the best, best effect, effect 72 yeah. hours yeah, and that's what, what we tell everyone um, but high risk exposures you know um, they, they do define sort of like four or five days but 
that also shouldn't be abused. Mm. Especially in South Africa. And Especially in South Africa, yeah. Mm. yeah. So, mm. I mean, look, if you find yourself having had an encounter, you can always come to the Jens Clinic. And mm. it's, again, mm. it's another means for accessible healthcare to people. It's embarrassing. I've had it. I've, I've seen it myself. Yeah. With patients coming in in the middle of the night to Wait, the emergency department. What do you mean you've had it? No, I mean, I've had the experience of with a patient. Oh, okay. <laughs> not yes, myself. It's, it's, it's not not necessarily <laughs> just sexual exposure. It's, I mean... For, I mean, us operating can be needle stick injuries yeah. Yeah. and like eye splashes as well. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I've taken, you've taken uh, a, a PIP, prep for yeah. those, eye splash and yes. stuff like that. Have you guys heard of on-demand PrEP? So, yes, I've heard of that. So, when a patient is now, they, they're going for a holiday where they think they may be engaging in risky sexual behavior. They're like, all right, I need yeah. to come and take but that. It, it, so, the research was done on men who have sex with men and mm-hmm. transgender women. Okay. And it found that, and and also we describe it in people who are sort of like in abusive relationships. Uh-huh. So let's make an example of a man who works, let's say he's abusive and he works away from home and the wife knows that he's coming home this weekend. And then you go to the clinic and you be like, um, listen, my husband is coming back. I suspect he's HIV positive. He's abusive to me. I know he's going to want to sleep with me this weekend and he never uses a condom. I, I want something to protect me. He's coming tomorrow. Mm. Mm. Um, it's also for prostitutes. And like I said, men have sex with men, for example. Yeah, so any any risky sexual so behavior. So basically, yeah. it's called the 2-1-1 principle, right, Ness? Mm. So um, <clears throat> if you know you're going to have sex tomorrow and it's going to be high-risk sex, like we explained, someone who's probably has HIV, you take two tablets today and then... If sex doesn't happen, then you don't take any more. But if sex happens, then you take one, ta- so two today, one tablet on the day sex happens and another tablet the following the, day. The after- and that's Tomorrow. enough? Is yeah. That sufficient? And, that, and that's been shown to be effective to protect from. But of course, if sex is now going to continue on the Monday, Tuesday, after the week, obviously now you, you must, must continue. You must continue on the tablet yeah. every single day. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. interesting. Okay. No, no, I mean, look, and that's why we have the platform where you can sit at home Mm. If if this has happened, you don't need to go. It's it's uncomfortable again going to a nurse yeah. telling them I've had this like, the condom burst. You know, yeah. these are the types of conversations you have mm. to have with someone at midnight on a, on a Friday night yeah. when people are being stabbed in the background. <laughs> so <laughs> and ideally, I think it's an yeah. easier way for you to consult with the doctor, and we'll give you advice, and we'll obviously try and counsel you on on safe sexual practices what and give you the medication that you require. Also um, good for our patients is that many times I've had patients consult us at the Jane's clinic and maybe they're a bit embarrassed or insecure about their complaint and they don't want the video on. So I'm just, I'll just say to them, okay, put your video on so I can see I'm talking to a person, you know, let's have the introduction with your video on, you know, build a rapport, you know, I'm Dr. Matthews, I'm so-and-so, I'm calling from this place. And then once we've set that in, then they switch the video off and they're comfortable to talk mm, you know, yeah. um, from yeah. that. 100%. Let's move on to the next question. Yeah. This patient wanted to find out, or this uh, follower of ours wanted to find out if we've checked, have you checked your test levels? And how, how can I tell whether I've got low testosterone? Yeah. Uh, are there like specific symptoms or things I can look at on my body that will alert me to the fact that I've got low testosterone without actually having to go for the test first. So I think let's first talk about the clinical signs, Vish. What are the actual clinical signs of low testosterone? <clears throat> so I think, I mean, I think we can all just chip in sure, <laughs> with yeah, some yeah, answers. Sure, sure, but sure. Um, but we haven't as far as, as, far as I, I mean, I can know it's, it's so decreased muscle mass. Uh, specifically, I think you were mentioning. I think specifically, they say in your quadricep. So they look at quadricep. Um, yeah. I think that might be me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I suppose excess uh, body fat percentage, uh, especially abdominal, and then I mean, there's there's quite a lot of other things. Um, yeah. yeah. I think also yeah. like beard growth and and hair loss is also a thing because a lot of that hair loss, a lot of the testosterone converts to DHT. So if you have mm. high testosterone, you could be having a big beard and hair loss as well. Mm. Ah, that's one well, of the signs. Some guys actually think that they like uh, alpha males when they have a long beard and mm, balding. Actually, they, they actually they actually no, but oh, but that's you saying because they probably just have very high levels of DHT. Yeah. But DHT is very potent. 
There's something that okay. you can tell from ah, that. They're juicing. They're juicing. Ah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you look at the biggest bodybuilders in the world, like the, the guys so. in the, <laughs> the, the IFBB Pro. That doesn't pro. make sense. It really doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, no, 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 it It doesn't make sense. It doesn't. Okay, <laughs> why? Why not? So, for example, if you're taking anabolic stuff, you, you're going to grow a lot of facial hair as well. You can be bald and you have a lot of muscles, right? And you, you have a beard. And you have a beard. Because I mean, you you you're giving yourself either test. I think he's general, like generalizing too much. Oh, yeah, yes, it's, it's yes. No, no, no. But the thing is that it's important to correct this because now we don't want everyone who's both. And I mean, we're talking mm. of a country where majority of the population is black <laughs> and, bold. and and bold and bolding bold. is. You know, but they don't have beards. <clears throat> Yes, and I mean, yeah. much. Like, I'm, genetic, I'm, I'm, yeah. it's genetic. genetic, and it's a lot. Like, I mean, I look at my uncle and look at my dad, for example. You know, I really don't think it's. Uh, whereas, if you look at your brothers, your uncle, your dad, is there anyone in your family who doesn't have a big beard? No. Yeah, sure. Is there anyone with you know? So it's you understand? A big genetic There's component a huge to it. Genetics but if you look at the it, IFBB so. Pro uh, champions, if you look at that stage, all those guys are just bald. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No yeah. Okay, but no beard. So this thing of Muslims. But bald. I, it's sort of making sense now why in Islam you can have multiple wives. I think Prophet was onto something. <laughs> he just knew these bras are going to have high test. <laughs> they need more wives. Bald and bearded. <laughs> yeah. But so the other aspect anyway. to that question was... Yeah, have what, we checked have our, we checked our tests? tests? Yeah. Yeah. You and now you, the table? you guys are Muslim, so you're going to tell us now. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, this, this clown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now let's end with me. Everybody else want to okay. tell this and then I'll tell yes, you my story. Because mine is more so what's sense. the normal range for us? We're 30, about 30 to 32 years old. We'll have to check it. So I think <laughs> probably... But roughly, roughly. Roughly. Probably. I think we should yes, be... Yes, we don't have time for you to check this. Left. Just give, on, us the, give us the... We should thing. be at least... Look, the, the, the range that we use in at our clinic uh, is 300 to 660, right? Yeah. So that's... Uh, it's oh, obviously... What, what um, measurement is this? Is it nanomoles per... Uh, nanomoles? Nanograms per deciliter. Nanograms yeah. per deciliter, Yeah. But okay. for the layman who doesn't really so care about that. So none of us should be below 300 or 350. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's. Wait, the thing is that there's I'm a range powerful. of testosterone, right? But it, it needs to be age. Age specific. Age specific. That's I'm saying for 30 so year olds. That's why I want to go just check that. 30 to 32. But yeah. we shouldn't be below 30, 350. There are other things that need to be also looked at. So your free testosterone, your sex hormone binding globulin as well. Yeah. So it's not just. It's yeah, just it's not. not yeah. okay. It's, it's, it's not to be looked in isolation. And that's yeah. why you need to come and actually consult. And, and, looking, and, and the blood test needs to be taken at a specific mm. point in the day. Yeah. Pre- preferably yeah. before yeah. 10 a.m. So, yeah. so average, average is 420. By so the we've done all age hours and we should be at 420. Yeah. You haven't. You, have, you haven't done yours? Yeah. Nasim, have you done yours? What was yours? Last time 600. Oh, sure. wow. Okay. Yeah. So have you done yours? It's, I'm powerful. Mine was 680. Sure. Yes, I have key. I'm 470, man. 470. I think Ness's theory is correct. <laughs> <laughs> eh? <laughs> what genetics do I have now that's making yeah. me at 680? I don't is know what genetics you have. Is this on or off? Huh? Is this on or off? <laughs> on or off what? <laughs> I'm, <okay. laughs> you, I'm not on TRT. <laughs> I'm not on TRT, like... Uh, okay. know, what are you on? Nothing. I don't know what he's talking oh, about. Okay. <laughs> what are you saying? On Ashwagandha. <laughs> on Ashwagandha. Oh, on Ash- I'm on Ashwagandha. I'm 700. And, 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 and zinc and magnesium. Yeah. Now, my levels, I checked I checked it earlier this year because I was a little bit... Co- I, I just wanted to screen. And then earlier this year, my levels were around 440. But then subsequently, a couple of weeks went by started experiencing a lot of the, the symptoms that you find on the Adams uh, questionnaire. Mm. What are the symptoms, eh? The, 
So the symptoms, uh, firstly, the Adams question is just one of the surveys we use on our website to determine whether you potentially may have low testosterone mm-hmm. or the, the, the clinical features. Um, and so the things I was actually experiencing is like very low energy sleep disturbance, like not able to sleep well at night. Mm-hmm. And then subsequently, then in the day, I'm feeling tired and exhausted. And then I thought, is it the sleep that's affecting me in, in, in my work? And and I uh, in in exercise because I I started to not be able to perform as well in the gym as much as I my my then my libido started to decrease I didn't have as much sex drive and then also mentally I was just having like brain fog mm-hmm. you know where things that I would normally I'd be able to process much quicker was now taking me way way longer mm-hmm. and then I started thinking to myself okay. You know, I'm, 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 I'm quite a high risk on this Adam score, which I tell patients all the time, mm. you know, you need to get help for this. So I said, okay, I'm going to go to the lab. I'm going to get my bloods checked. Let me check it out. So recently I checked my levels and they were just under 300. So about 280. And this is your free total? Yeah, this is the free, test, uh, uh, free testosterone. The, all the other parameters were normal, except my luteinizing hormones were slightly on the, uh, on, on the higher limit of normal. Um, I don't know if we want to discuss that fully, uh, mm-hmm. but in the interest of time, maybe we'll, we can we can delve much deeper. And I think we have had a, one of our previous episodes we discussed yeah. all the the different tests. We'll just put the link somewhere here so you can watch that specific episode where we talk about the breakdown. But basically, with having the low testosterone or slightly lowered level of testosterone with the <clears throat> symptoms, so not just in isolation. I definitely feel like I'm a candidate for TRT Mm -hmm. and I'm experiencing all these symptoms. So why not at least give it a try? Although my concern is, and one of the things that people must know is if you start pure TRT, testosterone replacement therapy, you are at risk for infertility. And I ideally would want to have kids in the future. Mm -hmm. So we're here. Let's chat about what are my options. And I, I think we, we as a team, you know, we oftentimes discuss patients, issues, problems, And so I put my case forward to everyone to give me advice specifically on how best to treat yeah. my 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 current uh, situation. Yeah. So just in terms of general measures, I would I would first um, want to look at sort of lifestyle changes. Mm-hmm. So you did mention the fact that you do exercise. Yeah. Um, so looking at the type of exercise you do, so mm. we all know that you know um, there's certain exercises that would naturally sort of increase your amount of Total mm. testosterone, meaning free or bound. Yeah. 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 So, um, so things like squats and um, high intensity, what deadlifts they low for? deadlifts. Yeah. 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 So obviously, trying to incorporate that. Yeah. That would be just the general, right? Trying to look at your diet. Mm. Um, trying to make sure that you're obviously on sort of low fat diet. Yeah. Or on some kind of a diet or sort of a diet plan. Yeah. yeah. Right. And um, and then I would instantly consider supplements mm. yeah mm. yeah um but what i've noticed with most of the patients that we see have they've actually already read up on that I, we, you're a doctor i'm sure you've already yeah. read up on most of that you probably already the, and, on. and the, the the frightening thing for me was like i could see that i'm not making any progress in the mm-hmm. gym and i'm not seeing the same results that i would get if i had to do these exercises say two three years ago yeah, yeah. I, I i wouldn't have the same mm-hmm. feeling like I, i can't even explain it to you like the same energy level that I had to do the exercise, the same yeah. like motivation and drive, mm-hmm. which is something that is led by testosterone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to make a point on diet, right? So testosterone is a cholesterol. It's a, mm. that's a, you need cholesterol in your diet. So yeah, I know you only like white eggs. No, I, I've been the, eating. The and, and, and we had this conversation and I eat whole oh, eggs. Yeah. I don't cut out the yolks. I make sure I get enough. I'll eat like three to four eggs every morning. For me, um, what I've noticed with you is your sleeping pattern. You work shifts. Mm. So you'd work three days night and then three days off. Is that is that so? So currently, no. No, no not, not, oh, a, not okay. anymore. But at a period there was. And definitely that could have been something yeah. that affected yeah. it. Definitely. Your, yeah, your sleep is very important. Yeah. yeah. So let's say, I mean, we've done that. Um, so we've done the diet, the exercise, the lifestyle, the, correct, the, lifestyle the, lifestyle, the supplements yeah. as well. Supplements are important because, I mean, I take supplements. I'm sure we all take supplements I, and daily. And I've been taking the, the, yeah. the ZMA, the Tongat Ali, the Ashwagandha, as, as mm-hmm. Nasim recommended. And 
and then still I'm, yeah, I'm experiencing yeah, yeah. these and then uh, D as well. So yeah, using D, using TRT D3? and D as well. Yeah. Yeah. Using TRT and maintaining fertility is there a way that we can? Well, um, so if you're using human chorionic gonadotropin hormone, there is room for in, in in replacement of using testosterone replacement therapy. You can yeah, use that as an alternative. Yeah, I H-C-G, think just just yeah? just just to explain to yeah, um, and um, have you guys heard anything about using? So let's say Suel does consider TRT, right? Or let's say Suel was on TRT, but he wants so he's coming to see us now for fertility issues so he wants to get his fertility back he's telling us that you know what doc when i started i was on 200 i'm now i've been sitting on 500 i mean i'm the best form Mm. you know um is there something is there room for hcg for someone who's not hypo who doesn't have secondary hypogonadism like would you because essentially what hcg does is that Mm. you you're increasing lh fsh you're stimulating your testicles to start working Can they start working if you, you mean, already have for someone who has so for someone who has secondary hypogonadism? So you meaning there's a problem, problem at the top in the, yes, the brain no, no. at the bottom? No, I'm saying someone who doesn't have it. So it's primary hypogonadism. Yeah. No, 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 no. Prime, Listen, primary so, is a problem at the testicles. So it's yes, like yes. The, what I'm saying is that the yeah. person doesn't have problems. He's, he's on TRT. TRT. He just just for pure. Yes. So when you, you're increase. on TRT, you've kind of we're forgetting down there, yeah. right? Okay. Yes, which is why you get infertility or shut down. Right. Yeah, so I'm you, saying you kick starting over. now yeah. Yeah. by giving them HCG, yeah. Yeah. hoping that their testes will start working, yeah. just making like normal natural, sure. and then they're still using the T- test. sort of the test that you, that they're injecting. Oh, so yeah. to use it oh. concurrently. Concurrently. So my question was, is there room for for that? And do, you, do you guys know? And, and to use again. the TRT yeah. at the same time. Yeah. yeah. I actually for patient yeah so i actually yesterday because we had uh, we actually had this discussion yesterday uh, on our whatsapp group and so i decided because in Atlanta you had suggested it i said let me go do some research on it found a couple of studies some studies say that it's not really advisable to do both simultaneously some say it's fine it's completely safe um essentially what you're doing is you're stimulating the factory uh, you, you're stimulating the brain to tell the factory at the bottom hey you need to you need to kickstart and and increase the production. If you're gonna on top of that give yourself testosterone, the risk is that you may have excessively high levels, okay. and then all the side effects that come with that, the gynecomastia, etc. Um, so they advise, preferably, if you're trying to preserve fertility, in someone like me who's never used anabolic steroids or anything like that, rather try and just use uh, HCG to kickstart your HPA axis and get your your hypothalamus, your pituitary to tell your uh, uh, testes, make more testosterone, see what your level is. If you're still not getting the right level, you can still maintain the beta HCG and give testosterone to optimize your testosterone level and still to preserve the fertility because essentially what it is doing is it's giving you the LH and FSH surge mm-hmm. that you require. Yeah. And and um, interestingly, also in that same study, with just HCG alone in an eight-week period, they found with patients who had hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, so uh, low LH and low yeah, low LH and FSH. So p- patients that uh, basically throughout their lives have never, you know, idiopathic uh, hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. They specifically did the study on them with uh, with HCG, and they found not only did it increase testosterone, libido, and fertility, but also penile length oh. by an average of point, uh, one point seven centimeters. <laughs> so, I'm starting my journey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, we established on the last podcast that we find, man. Yeah. Whether you were at yes. 10, speak for yourself. In terms of size, in terms <laughs> of size, important. It's important. Yeah. So yeah. I look. I think that that's an option for me. I think that that's something I would definitely mm. like to consider. The, the other options is uh, clomiphene citrate, clomid, mm. uh, which also basically tells your brain to tell your factory at the bottom you need to produce more testosterone, but also uh, preserve the fertility, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. which is which is essentially what what uh, I, I I ideally would want. Yeah. So I'm yeah. I'm I'm keen to at least try and see if I I do feel better. 
oh, I want to feel like I did a few years ago when going to the gym was wasn't a difficult thing. Yeah. And like just performing, you know, at work did, didn't become a difficult task, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's just something that I, I I am looking forward to with with being on 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 this specific uh, tailored TRT plan. Yeah. Yeah. Any other things you'd like to add on that before we close, guys? If you want to do your Adam Score questionnaire, go on the website. There's a free questionnaire to do. Yeah, gensclinic.co.za. You can come and you can actually answer all the questions. Uh, take it's a completely free survey it gives you a response it gives you feedback based on the questions that you answer mm. what you may specifically be suffering with and then you can come and chat to us about your your trt journey start your trt journey with us talk to us about uh, fertility yeah. talk to us about whether that's an issue for you or not i mean it, if, if it's not we can give you straight up testosterone and we have options there are options that the different treatment mod modalities we have testosterone trochets mm -hmm. uh we have uh, testosterone supionate injections there's a wide variety but i think the the first step is actually just taking the the, the leap and saying i may have the symptoms it was tough for me to even admit it to myself but i said hey i may be I may be a patient myself and, yeah. and, and relinquish yourself to that. As we know, men don't like to seek help and they yeah. maybe seek help too late. So come early. Let's catch it early when you're younger. Let's try and fix and rectify the problem and, and, and get you healthier for the rest of your life. That's, that's what I think. Yeah. 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 yeah cool. Any other questions? Um, look, I think we, we, we kind of are running out of time. Yeah. I, I see quite a bit of questions there, but maybe. We'll address them. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll address them in our next <clears throat> episode. Um, we we would like to to, to touch uh, a a little more on weight loss. Uh, that's something that we we are trying to work with in tandem with TRT mm -hmm. uh, because we do know that you know patients that are diabetic, obese, uh, or have other lifestyle diseases like hypertension and cholesterol, it can affect their testosterone, and so we ideally want to incorporate TRT with a weight loss program that our patients can benefit from. Yeah. Well, so important. I think we'll discuss that more in depth in our next podcast episode. We look forward to having more guests yeah. and more great chats. And more questions. Yeah. So that's another episode <laughs> of The Gents Clinic. Thank you guys for watching. Please like, follow, subscribe, watch all of our videos. And don't forget to visit www.gentsclinic.co.za Book a consultation, have a chat. We're always available to talk and we're always willing to help. My name is Dr. Sir Essa, signing oh, out. Yes, guys. It's Dr. Brendan Matthews, signing out. <laughs> Dr. Nanda Bilagazi, signing out. Dr. Nassim Sharif. Dr. Nader, signing out. All right, that's been another episode from us. Take care, peace, love, good night.